Okay, so now we're going to look at finishing off chapter 52, which is selection and erection of wiring systems. We've talked about the wiring systems themselves with the reference methods, and we've talked about sizing of the live conductors, we've talked about the sizing of the neutrals, we've talked about the volts drop. We're now going to look at some other common things we need to consider, starting with 526, which is electrical connections. So, it says, every connection between conductors or between a conductor and other equipment shall provide durable electrical continuity with adequate mechanical strength. So they must be correctly selected. So you must at this point understand the potential, um, the requirements of the integrity, mechanical integrity, electrical uh, integrity of any connection. But this, this includes things like future maintainability, um, changes in ambient temperature, changes in environment. You've got to try to understand all this at this stage when you select a method of connection. It'll take account of the material, the number and shape of the conductor to ensure that obviously the connection is suitable, the size of it, the number to be connected together. So obviously if you're going to connecting three or four cables together, we're not going to cram them into a terminal that's not suitable for that. The temperature retained at the terminals in normal service such that the effectiveness of the insulation of the conductors connected to them is not impaired. So obviously if it's like a cold tail type of termination where the point of connection is one that will actually create a heating effect, then the insulation will be stripped back with maybe some um, heat proof or over sheathing applied. And the provision of adequate locking arrangement if there's a, a situation that is subject to vibration or regular thermal cycling. 5263, every connection shall be accessible for inspection, testing, and maintenance except for the following. Um, so here's just an illustration of, you know, it's different sizes and different um, connections with, you know, this MCB here has one, two, three, four, five connections within it. I'm pretty sure if you look at the manufacturers that they do not recommend that. 5263 tells us every connection will be accessible unless... It's a joint designed to be buried in the ground, a compound filled or encapsulated joint. Connection between the cold tail and heating element. A joint made by welding, soldering, brazing or appropriate compression. So this would be like your, your crimper would be an appropriate compression method. Joints or connections made in equipment by the manufacturer of the product. So, you know, some equipment that you buy has just simple push fits where you push the contact down, it comes out and you just spring them in. Or equipment compliant with BS5733 for a maintenance-free accessory and marked with the symbol MF. This this came out a few editions ago, but obviously we had a big um, a big change in our our work attitude. And we started looking at um, push connections, you know, um, and most electricians, especially ones fresh out of college, will wouldn't wouldn't go anywhere near. Um, a connector block these days so yeah um, this is a common method it's okay to be maintenance free as long as it's terminated in a way that is recognized as maintenance free with the enclosure you have to have this symbol which you can just about see here okay so do make sure if you do have a maintenance free connection it has been correctly selected for that purpose We then have 5264. Where necessary, precautions will be taken so that the temperature attained by a connection in normal service will not impair the effectiveness of the insulation of the conductors connection to it or any insulating material used to support the connection. So you've got to understand if there is any thermal cycling or if there's rapid changing in loading, if there will be a overall heating effect that may be um, inherent on the cabling or the adjacent cabling, for example. So you have to consider the working temperatures of all connections. Uh, we then have 5265. Every termination of a joint in a live conductor or a pen conductor will be made within one of the following or a combination thereof. A suitable accessory, an equipment enclosure complying with the appropriate standard, an enclosure partly formed or completed within building material which is non-combustible when tested. To be S4764. There'll be no appreciable mechanical strain on the connection or conductors. 
If connections made in an enclosure, the enclosure will provide adequate mechanical protection and protection against relevant external influences. Let's flip. Let's go all the way back to um, chapter forty-one. Um, basic protection and fault protection. We said that basic protection is sheathing. So you have your insulation, but then you have your sheathing. And it says here, if it's going into an enclosure, there must be adequate mechanical protection and protection against relevant external influences. Otherwise, we may harm this sheathing. If we're going to be stripping it back, that has to be considered as a changing in the protective measure. If I strip a cable a sheath off in an enclosure, the enclosure becomes the layer of insulation or the barrier because I've removed the other one. I've removed the sheath. Connections like this, this is 526.8. Cause of sheath cables from which the sheath has been removed and non-sheath cables at the termination of a conduit, ducting or trucking will be enclosed. Again, yeah. We have here sheathing. This provides a layer of protection. We have here unsheath cabling. This 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 is abs you know, there is a, a layer of protection absent from here, so it does not achieve basic and full protection. So this mustn't occur. 527. Session duration of a wiring system to minimize the spread of fire. So we have to consider fire compartmentation. Alright. So 527.1.2. A wiring system shall be installed so that the general building structural performance and fire safety are not reduced. Um, so you need to understand when you design your installation what the existing fire barriers are, where they are, what their ratings are. In the domestic world, we think typically of something like a, a three hour, a 90 minute duration for a ceiling of plasterboard. And we know if we cut a downlight into that, we're gonna have to most likely install a fire rated luminaire, a luminaire that actually you know re reinstates the existing level of protection. So we must make sure we don't break that. And it is, as this illustration here shows, when we take lots of services through a fire compartment, we must reinstate that compartment as best we can to of equal or improved degree. So some information there on the requirements of cable types and ceiling penetrations, etc. And then it goes to 528 which is proximity of wiring systems to any other service. Um, this this is, you know, except where one of the phone methods is adopted, there is neither a, a voltage of band 1 nor a voltage of band 2 circuit to be contained in the same wiring system as a circuit of a nominal voltage exceeding that of low voltage and a band 1 circuit should not be contained in the same system as a band 2 voltage. So what we're saying is, if I have a circuit of band one, let's say it's a circuit of 12 volts, it's likely that that circuit is wired in cabling for that voltage rating, maybe somewhere up to 50 volts, no more. You know, um, data cable, telecommunications cabling, and things like that. If I was to then put that into the same enclosure as mains power, if there was any damage to insulation, or even if there was just regular switching and there was some kind of um, induced effect with the electromagnetic fields uh, changing, that voltage that would be induced into the ELV or band one cabling could then go down to the equipment that it's connecting to and harm that equipment. Similarly, if we have a voltage that is in excess of low voltage, such as 1000 volts plus, we need to make sure it's segregated from anything at low voltage. So we must segregate band one from band two, band one and band two from, L, from beyond LV. All right. This illustration here just kind of shows you Oh, it's just a mess, really, but it shows you really other services such as pipe work and cabling. The relationship there is not very good. Okay. This is 528.3 non electrical services. All right, so, so 528.1 band one, band two, but and LV. Your common example of that would be your, your compartment dado trunking. So you have your data going to your data points and then your free band one and your band two will be your mains power. High voltage has just been put in here for completeness, but there is segregation between them. The um, it, There are a couple of options. Uh, I mean, it does say that every cable, you know, you're allowed this if every cable of the conductor is insulated for the highest voltage present. So if I was to take the high voltage cable type 
and then wired the band two and the band one circuit in that cable type, I could then put them all in one compartment. Okay, and, e and then number two, each conductor within the multi-core cable is insulated for the highest voltage present in the cable. Same thing, so that's like a interconnecting cable for your smoke alarms that you have at home. You have your mains power line and neutral feeding one alarm, then there'll be a three core to the following alarms, and that third core is just a a sensor cable or a, a an a you know a, a signal cable that talks to all the other alarms. It's a simple band one circuit, but it's allowed because it's within a a, a cable insulated to the highest voltage present, which is obviously the um the two thirty volts. Uh, then we have um, on a tray with a petition or separate wiring systems. Proximity of communication cables. In the event of crossing or proximity of an underground telecommunications cable, we will need a clearance of 100 mil maintained at all times. Or we'll have to have a fire retardant petition between them. Or when they cross, there'll be mechanical protection at that point. So when they cross over. It's always good practice with this kind of thing, though, to have that space. And then when they do cross... What you kind of want to do is have them going across at you know a perfect right angle, really. So there's you know there's no drag or there's no risk of induced voltages or it's minimised. Try and go over an exact right angle when you're passing across telecommunications cabling. Non-electrical services, yep. Yeah, Illustrated just just me go, but here's another example. So you know you've got to make sure that you have effective proximity of non-electrical services, gas, water, whatever they are. Do make sure that you play ball and you work nicely with other trades. 528.3.5 No cable should be run in the lift or hoist well unless it forms part of the lift installation as defined in BSEN 81. Okay, so we're not allowed to run any cabling or wiring systems within a lift shaft unless our work is part of the lift installation. Kind of makes sense because of the risks in there. And if we could use a lift shaft, then we would because of the fact that it's an easy rising main. And to finish off chapter 52, we have selection and erection of wiring systems in relation to maintainability, including cleaning. <sighs> Bit of a mouthful. So it says, with regards to maintainability, reference we made to 132.12, which was way back in part one. Where it's necessary to remove any protective measure in order to carry out a maintenance provision that shall be made so that the protective measure can be reinstated without reduction of the degree of protection originally intended. So take, for example, a barrier or an enclosure. If it's saying to maintain or to uh, clean the equipment, if it requires removing of a lid or removing of a box or removing of a component, it shouldn't be diminished. Its life will not be diminished. It will not be damaged. It will be weakened. And when it will be reinstated, it will be in no lesser state. Okay. Good good example of this I uh, is something that I see in the food industry, which is with regards to hygiene processes, the cleaning, where um, they 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 um, specify electrical plant and panels and equipment to IP, um, you know, six eight. So you know maybe six seven as high as they can with moisture ingress but it still gets in there it still gets in there and they can't def you know they can't remove it but they actually um, produced in germany for the electric vehicle industry a higher category of ip 69 k which we um discovered and we sourced in and they make exclusive switch gear and control gear and assembly equipment for ip 69 k and the IP idea of that is it's got you know, this is the illustration of the test condition for that. You know, multiple angles and you know, very, very high pressure. And we've we've been um, pushing them through a number of businesses, and it's been quite successful. But it was it was um, it was assumed that IP six eight or whatever, let's say eight, which is immersion, was uh, the best you could get with regards to moisture ingress, because you know it's for in swimming pools for crying out loud. But there's a difference when you have pressure. When you have an increased level of pressure, it can actually still penetrate an IP68 enclosure. So they've gone up to IP69, which is a tighter degree. And it's actually called IP69K, K being obviously a an impact category there. So um, 
that's you know that's just an example of something that we've had we've seen before where we had to with our selection erection of equipment we had to verify a suitable piece of equipment for cleaning as a as a process all right that takes us to the end of chapter 52 we're going to start protection isolation switching control and monitoring in the next video all right cool